Up next, it's a hearing held today to consider legislation regulating the cable television industry. Members of the House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Telecommunications and Finance hear from a number of representatives from the cable industry about consumer issues, including rates and services. Good morning. <clears throat> Today the subcommittee begins a series of important hearings to consider cable legislation that uh, is before it. The 1984 there was a general agreement that fragmented government regulation was stifling the development of the cable industry. Cable operators could not make long-term commitments to upgrade their facilities or to invest in improved programming because their revenue projections depended upon the decisions of unpredictable local regulators. At that time, local governments were making unreasonable demands of cable operators, and cable operators were making unfound pro unfounded promises to local governments. Passage of the Cable Act in 1984 benefited both cable operators and consumers. Cable operators now have greater regulatory and franchise certainty, which has led to capital improvement and increased programming. ESPM, MTV, CNN, FNN, CNBC, C-SPAN, and TBS are as identifiable by most of the American public, of which nearly 60 percent now has cable, as are ABC, NBC, and CBS. The cable revolution has altered, uh, has offered tremendous benefits. Cable has greatly increased the availability of educational, informational, and entertainment programming and has enriched the lives of television viewers. The 1984 Act, however, has not been without adverse side effects. Cable regulators, cable competitors, cable subscribers, and even some cable operators have decried many of the effects of deregulation. Issues as disparate as foreign ownership, <coughs> cable rates, customer service, sports siphoning, must carry, vertical and horizontal integration, third-party packaging, and telephone company entry into the video marketplace are the subjects of bills pending before the subcommittee. The subcommittee intends to examine each of these subjects as we move forward with our hearings. Let me be candid right from the start. Serious issues have been raised about the cable industry's practices, particularly its rates and service. The principal question before us is whether these issues can be resolved short of congressional intervention or whether they require remedial legislation. I have been open-minded and, and have listened to all sides of this debate for nearly two years. During this period, the subcommittee has been particularly aggressive in its oversight of the cable industry. Not only have we been responsive to hundreds of letters and inquiries from elected officials and consumers throughout the country, but we have held four hearings in the past two years. In addition, last year, we commissioned the GAO to undertake the largest national survey of cable rates to date, a second GAO survey that we requested, which follows up last year's effort, will be completed later this spring. After careful consideration, I have reached the conclusion that some form of legislation to re-regulate the cable industry is necessary. The actions of some in the cable industry have foreclosed all other options. Some cable operators have engaged in unconscionable acts that have harmed the public. Some cable operators have put their profits above their customers' interests with unjustifiable rate hikes, unresponsive customer service, and by manipulative programming practices. There must be a competitive marketplace for the distribution of video programming. In 1984, most members of Congress believe that direct broadcast satellites, wireless cable, and private cable would soon provide competition to cable operators. The growth of these technologies, however, has been much slower than anticipated. Similarly, competition between cable companies also was expected and, in fact, was promised by representatives of the cable industry. Yet today, in 99 percent of the communities served by cable, there is only one cable operator. 
While competition is clearly the preferable choice, until there is a truly competitive marketplace, <clears throat> some form of re-regulation is necessary to protect consumers. At this time, there are 10 bills pending before the subcommittee that contain creative proposals worthy of careful consideration. No doubt, as the process we are initiating today moves forward, there will be additional worthy proposals. Our task will be to take the best ideas from all of these and the best ideas that emerge from these hearings and produce a bill that reasserts the public interest as the first and foremost consideration of the cable industry. That concludes time for opening statement by the Chair. The Chair now turns to recognize the ranking minority member, the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Ronaldo. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I understand that the uh, gentleman from uh, Virginia, Mr. Bliley, has another commitment coming up momentarily, <coughs> and he has a statement that he would like to uh, read into the record. So at this time, I would request unanimous consent that I be allowed to yield to Mr. Bliley from Virginia. Without objection, the gentleman is uh, allowed to yield his time to the gentleman from Virginia. I thank, uh, I thank the gentleman from New Jersey. I also thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm pleased to welcome our distinguished panelists here this morning to update and explore the complexities of the cable television marketplace as they exist today. I trust that we will be able to see through all the rhetoric and talk about the facts, facts that cable in industry executives have to face as they <coughs> confront their bottom lines, and facts that subscribers face when they use cable service and subsequently pay their monthly bills. So I look around this room this morning, I see only a handful of my colleagues who were on this subcommittee during the time of the Cable Communications Policy Act of 1984. In fact, only four current members from each side of the aisle participated during the 1983 hearings on that act. What this indicates to me is that we need to evoke and examine the rationale of the subcommittee and the Congress at that time for enacting the Cable Act and determine to what extent that measure was successful or unsuccessful from the consumer's standpoint. There is no question that the public has become increasingly sensitive and restless over rising cable rates and spotty service. In many communities, consumers have seen cable rates rise by significant amounts. I think it important, however, to put these rises in perspective. Last August, the GAO released a study on cable rates that study found the level of basic service purchased by most customers rose 26 percent. <laughs> that same study, however, found that when you take into account the number of channels provided in those basic packages, the cost remained constant during the survey period at approximately 45 cents per channel per month. It is therefore important to look beyond the GAO study's time frame to assert, ascertain what more recent experience has been. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, cable rates rose at an annual rate of 3.8% for 1989, while overall consumer prices increased by 4.6%. This indicates the, quote, catch-up, unquote, period after de deregulation is over. The GAO is currently in the process of updating its previous report to include more recent price experiences. So while there have been rate increases and in some angry customers, I think that there is general agreement, even among the cable industry's harshest critics, that the quality, creativity, and diversity of cable programming has improved dramatically since 1984. In fact, a poll by the National Association of Broadcasters found that the public believed cable programming superior to broadcast programming in every concept, every category except local news. The improved quality is a direct result of the Cable Communication Polity Act of 1984's central features, rate deregulation and renewal stability. Having served as mayor of Richmond, Virginia, and as a member of that city's city council, I can tell you that city councils seldom, rather almost never, make decisions in rate regulation areas based on economics. Instead, they are made on a political basis. No local politician has ever been re-elected on a platform of higher cable rates. But many would like to campaign on a platform of keeping rates down, even if the proposed increases were justified and necessary. Without the city council looking over their shoulders, cable operators have been able to price services consistent with their value and the cost of providing that service. 
and with the assurance of renewal for good performance, they have enjoyed an increased incentive to invest in better products. For instance, in 1984, cable programmers spent about $300 million on basic cable programming. Last year, that figure was nearly $1 billion. That investment has led to the dramatic increase in the quality and availability of cable networks like Nickelodeon, Discovery Channel, Black Entertainment Television, ESPN, and CNN. Similarly, the Cable Act has removed a number of uncertainties and disincentive for operators to substanti substantially increase their investment in plant and equipment upgrades. Spending for this purpose has increased from about $200 million in 1984 to over half a billion dollars in 1989. These investments have benefited consumers through increased programming choices by improved picture quality and reliability. In the main, then, Congress made the right decision when it passed the Cable Communications Policy Act of 1984. I do not think the issues that led Congress to pass that act have changed dramatically. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the indulgence and for this time. Okay. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Siner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'll be very brief. First of all, let me commend you and the staff for putting this and the other hearings together. I think it's very important that we do this type of oversight at this time because the American people want to know what is the state of the industry and where are we going. I also want to commend my two colleagues, Mr. Boucher from Virginia and Mr. Cooper from Tennessee, for setting the parameters of this debate uh, between uh, the issues that we will be discussing. Hopefully, we can uh, find out more. As I begin to review this, I think the, the focus I'd like to give it, and really my bottom line is, is that what's best for the public and what is best for the consumers. And I've always believed that we should try to work towards a, uh, an agreement that will allow the consumers the best and most choices that are available, both in quantity and quality. And whether we go the re-regulation route or whether we go the competitive route, I hope that will be our attention and focus. One final thing on a personal note, I am glad I came here today. I have been informed by the D.C. officials who will be testifying that after 12 years of waiting, by this spring, I'm going to finally get cable here in the district. <laughs> now, as Rick Boucher told me before, <clears throat> Nicaragua got cable before I got it. <laughs> so I am going to come into the information age in the next couple of months, and I'm excited about that. And so I'm glad we're having these hearings because maybe that stimulated this new interest in making sure the district was not the last horizon that got it. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sure. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair once again recognizes the ranking minority member, the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Rinaldo. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, as uh, you alluded to in your statement, there is a gut feeling among some members of Congress that corrective action should be taken to give cable subscribers a stronger voice in effect in dealing with their local cable company. Well, let me state for the record that to its credit, the cable industry has not been insensitive to its own problems. <coughs> this subcommittee heard last August the rate increases have been moderate in real terms on the average. Although individual systems here and there continue to behave irresponsibly. Individual members of Congress do the same thing at some time, and yet the entire institution gets criticized. Cable's recent service quality initiative proves that it's possible to take meaningful collective action on basic problems that plague the entire industry, and will correct problems faster than any legislation that I know of would. In fact, legislation could probably make things even worse if it isn't the right type of legislation. Now, there's been some criticism of the industry's plan. Some people say it doesn't go far enough. Well, maybe it'll never go far enough to satisfy everyone. Some people say it doesn't give regulators enough teeth. How much teeth do we want to give regulators, and how much do we want regulators poking around? I look forward today, Mr. Chairman, to exploring the customer service plan and whether or not other problems ought to be assessed by it and how cable looks at it and how they think it's going to work. These and other steps, in my opinion, taken by the cable industry to clean up its own house should be welcomed by the city franchisers, should be welcomed by uh, people in the community, and should be welcomed by members of Congress. Freedom comes with responsibilities. And I want to commend Cable for facing up to these, their responsibilities as an industry. 
Now, some people cry for re-regulation as, as, as if it could be accomplished quickly and easily. Others say that cable has acted only under congressional pressure. Maybe that's so. And I agree that we must fine-tune the balance between cable systems, franchisers, and consumers. But I would rather have cable cleaning up their own messes than have the government jump in with both feet. Let me say that my congressional district, I feel that cable does an admirable, admirable job. In fact, just this morning, I received a copy of a resolution from a municipality in my district, North Plainfield, New Jersey, commending the local cable uh, system for the fine job they're doing. And I feel that it's much better for the industry and the franchisors to work out the minute details of any kinds of disputes than it is for the federal government to try and dictate solutions from on high. This is especially true in the rapidly changing cable marketplace. Cable may be a monopoly now, and that's argued time and time again. I've heard ever since I've been on the committee, we need competition in cable. We need more competition. Cable's not always going to be a monopoly. And anyone who doubts the veracity of that statement needs to look no farther than the Sky Cable and the other DBS partnerships that are springing up suddenly this year. Wireless cable will be online in more cities in the not too distant future. There will be competition and there will be cable company pitted against cable company in many municipalities from the east to the west and the north to the south. Now Congress usually keeps its hands off communications because we know that these industries serve our national interests most effectively when they're allowed to in effect freely slug it out in the marketplace. That's a free enterprise system. That's the American way. And that hands-off policy reflects the values both of the First Amendment and our market system. <coughs> we don't interfere with competitive relationships. We legislate when we feel we don't have a level playing field. Now much of what we've been hearing on both sides of the hill recently indicates that there are some individuals that feel that some leveling at this time is needed, that the time has come for some adjustment to the Cable Act's regulatory structure. This subcommittee's task this morning and in any subsequent hearings is to evaluate those claims and, yes, take a look at the criticisms of Cable and see if they're real and imagined and whether or not any action by this subcommittee or this Congress We'll get rid of those criticisms. We'll improve the system. Or will we just create more bureaucracy and make things even worse than they are now? Throughout our hearings this spring, I know and I hope that this subcommittee will work out the cable issues in the thoughtful, bipartisan fashion that marks most of our work on other communications initiatives. And as the cable debate moves forward in this Congress, I hope to work with Chairman Markey and all our witnesses and the other members of this subcommittee to improve stability in the cable industry. I think that's in the best interest of subscribers, I think it's in the best interest of Congress, and I think it's in the best interest of the municipalities that are served by cable. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Voucher. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to join with uh, Mr. Sinar in commending you and your staff for scheduling this series of three hearings on the problems that today beset the cable industry and uh, the subscribers who are receiving cable television service. I suppose I get more mail on problems associated with cable television than any other single subject. Uh, it seems like uh, every week I'm receiving another 50 to 75 letters from constituents throughout Southwest Virginia who are complaining about the fact that rates uh, are soaring and the service that they're receiving is less than adequate. In fact, cable today is an unregulated monopoly. That uh, monopoly status, unregulated status, was assured by the 1984 Cable Act. And uh, in this member's opinion, the cable industry has badly abused that unregulated monopoly status. And I join with the chairman in suggesting that the time has now come when Congress uh, should impose some very meaningful restraints on the industry. I think we basically have two choices before us. One of those is a return to rate regulation, which was the environment in which the cable industry uh, uh, lived prior to deregulation in 1986. The other choice I would suggest is somewhat more far-reaching and uh, is the preferable one. 
and that is to create an environment in which competition can thrive in the delivery of cable television services. The legislation that I've offered, the Cable Competition Act, now has 65 co-sponsors in the House, and it combines, I would suggest, the best features of rate regulation with uh, a market for competitive services. It would envision comp the uh, provision of rate regulation in the short term, so that if there is only one provider of cable service, the local government would have the authority to set the rates for a basic tier of television service. And we define in our legislation that basic tier as the local broadcast stations and the public broadcast station. When competition emerges later on, the authority of the local government to uh, establish rates would then expire, and the competitive market would determine the rate. In order to foster that competitive market, we would remove the restraints that exist today on telephone companies offering cable television service. I think they are the logical competitor for today's cable industry. And I would suggest that a number of benefits would flow from enacting that legislation. First, rates would be established through the provision of competition. Let the free market operate. Secondly, we would have alternative viewing services available. And I would suggest that if there's more than one provider in the market, the quality and quantity of programming services would improve dramatically over that offered by a single provider. And then third, and in terms of national economic implications, most importantly, the legislation would encourage a modernization of the national telecommunications infrastructure. Telephone companies say that eventually they'll deploy fiber optic cable over what's known as the last mile from their branch networks into homes and businesses nationwide. But if they don't have the authority to offer a video signal to provide cable television service, that deployment might take as much as 30 years in the less densely populated rural parts of the country. I'm told that if uh, we enact legislation now, which gives telephone companies the authority to deliver cable television service, we could cut that time uh, in half or maybe by as much as two thirds. And by modernizing the infrastructure in that manner, we can enhance the national economy at the same time. So I think competition offers some advantages that mere rate regulation doesn't. And during the course, uh, Mr. Chairman, of this hearing today and the other two hearings that will follow, I hope that we can examine those issues in detail. I thank you very much uh, for offering this opportunity to inquire into what I think is an important national subject. I look forward to hearing today's witnesses uh, and those that will follow on the uh, following two days of hearings. I thank the, the uh, gentleman. Uh, time has now expired. The chair once again recognizes the gentleman from uh, New, New Jersey, Mr. Rinaldo. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in my uh, opening statement, I mentioned the resolution passed by the borough of North Plainfield. I think it only appropriate under those circumstances that it should be included in the record and request unanimous consent that it be included as part of the record. Without objection, it will be included in the record at the appropriate point. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Ritter, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'd like to commend you for holding this series of hearings on the cable industry. Uh, since uh, Mr. Sinar mentioned that uh, cable came first to Nicaragua, and uh, we, we've seen Danielle Ortega been, be defeated at the polls, uh, one wonders whether cable coming to Washington, D.C. will mean that Marion Barry will fall too. <laughs> And, uh, I, I recommend we stay tuned to the new soap, The Next Days of Our Lives, starring Marion Barry, Jim Mooney, and the cable industry. Um, Mr. Chairman, there's obvious concern from consumers across America and, and uh, members on the Hill about the rates and the service of cable. And while many of my colleagues will agree that improvements in the cable industry need to be made, there are certainly differences in the way we would like to see these improvements become reality. I personally believe that competition will tend to bring cable service to the most people for the best price. The marketplace should decide what price is too much for basic cable service, not city councils who are motivated less by economics and far more by politics. The problem in the past has been defining, quote, effective competition, unquote, for cable services. The FCC is currently deliberating on this definition, and any movement on the part of the legislature uh, prior to 
that kind of uh, result coming back to us, I think, would be premature. My own district, the Lehigh Valley of Pennsylvania, the Allentown, Bethlehem, Eastern area, has the distinction of housing one of the few competing cable systems in the country. I, I believe there are some 39 what, what you would call uh, competing cable si uh, such districts. Uh, I've been informed that approximately 95 percent of my, my district is overbuilt. That's where you have two or, or more competitors having access to cable in the home. The 1989 rates for the two largest systems in my district were $12.50 for 38 <coughs> basic channels and $12.99 for 40 basic channels, respectively. These rates were far below the national average while providing more channels than the national average. The Lehigh Valley experience and competition shows that not only is competition viable, but it seems to keep rates reasonable without regulation. Competition in the cable industry is rapidly becoming a reality that we can no longer ignore. If not from other cable systems, as in the Lehigh Valley of Pennsylvania, but from other forms of multi-channel distribution, wireless cable, multi-channel, multi-point distribution systems, and direct broadcast satellites. These technologies are going to be a large part of the way we will receive television in the country in the future. And, and I think it's, it's, it's amazing to me that two years out of the box, when we deregulated cable, and we witnessed some very important advances, as even uh, proponents of regulation have admitted, we're back uh, seeking to re-regulate, as if two years somehow allows the kind of interplay of technologies in the marketplace that uh, we know happen uh, across the length and breadth of market-oriented systems. Cable has been successful so far in thwarting these technologies by locking up much of the ava available programming, and that's maybe something we, we need to take a much closer look at. Vertical integration between the cable operator and the program provider has given cable an inherent advantage over other forms of video distribution. But the tables are turning. Uh, as the ranking member, Mr. Rinaldo, mentioned, the Sky Cable DBS project, a joint venture between <laughs> Hughes, NBC, Cable Vision Systems, and News Corporation, will invest over $1 billion to make DBS a reality. And then you have the whole possibility of DBS and high-definition television coming online as well. By 1993, they plan on delivering 108 channels of programming that will be received by a flat antenna one square foot in size. Now, this is what's happening in the United States of America and happening now because of market forces and because of competition. Now, why is this amazing new technology going to be available to the public? Because competition drives technology, and regulation stagnates technology. Only competition in the cable field from all possible providers, including telephone companies, as is pointed out in the voucher bill, will drive competition, which in turn will drive, not stifle, technology. The GTE Cerritos California experiment is a perfect example of this phenomenon. They've installed an interactive fiber optic cable system, and uh, many of us will be monitoring the success and the performance of this high-tech uh, fiber cable system. We must always strive for the next generation of technology. The vision exists, but we must have the incentive of competition to drive the technology. Without the competitive force, the consumer is going to pay more for less service, and the United States, as an overall information-based, high-tech economy, will suffer. In the area of service, I'm glad to see that the NCTA has recommended customer service standards for its members. It is about time that cable has come to realize that cable companies can't continue to treat customers poorly. Unfortunately, the airline industry in this country has not learned that lesson, but that's a whole other story. On the other hand, you don't see people racing around calling for airline re-regulation given the size and the complexity of the problem, which certainly does exist and something needs to be done, but nobody out there is calling for re-regulation. I think NCTA realizes that when the competition for video services becomes a reality, the service provider 
with the lowest rates and the best service is going to be chosen by the consumer. In the final analysis, re-regulation legislation is unnecessary, except perhaps for interim adjustments to the Cable Act if true competition is available competition driving technological advances is going to bring the cable industry uh, into the next century. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Oxley, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The uh, pending cable bills that uh, we will consider address a myriad of important issues regarding the cable television industry, and I endorse your efforts and the committees to give complete coverage to uh, all of them. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I hope as these hearings uh, progress and we confront all these issues that we keep two things in mind. First, we all know that the FCC, under the very capable leadership of Chairman Sykes, is currently preparing its report to Congress regarding cable rate regulation and competition. We must tread carefully to make sure that we do not step on the Commission's toes before it presents its full report. The administrative process is very delicate. That is why we cannot have uh, Chairman Sykes before us today. Uh, we have given Mr. Sykes the ball, and he expects to uh, hand it over uh, to us in July. Still, I look forward to what the uh, various witnesses have to say about the measures which are pending before this committee and before the FCC. Secondly, I hope the committee uh, keeps in mind two of the principles which have served as cornerstones of communications policies uh, since the uh, 1934 uh, Communications Act, that is, diversity of viewpoints and localism. American cable consumers are blessed with a wide array of diverse, high-quality entertainment and information programming sources. Since deregulation, marketplace demand has caused this increase in varied programming services and has, in turn, resulted in a substantial, ever-growing augmentation in cable subscriber uh, penetration. While the cable industry has responded well to the cable <coughs> consumer's hunger for uh, more, more diverse programming, I refuse to believe that subscribers are being starved to death by increased rates. If the service is lousy, if the prices on the menu are too high for what you're getting, you simply walk out of the restaurant and go somewhere else. <coughs> Cable can and has been discontinued by numerous consumers since deregulation. They have their VCRs, their satellite <coughs> dishes, their wireless cable, DBS, their movie houses, their local sporting events, and so on. And they have quality television from their local broadcast stations. This brings up the second important principle, localism. If consumers choose to taste the delicious uh, delicacies offered by cable, they should not at the same time be, den be denied the local broadcast programming that is uniquely responsive to local community needs. Here I am talking specifically about newly developing low-power television broadcasters who are filling a local void in rural areas in small-town America left by the distant big city broadcasters. If the interest, in the interest of localism, these community broadcasters should not have to risk being shut off from their own community because they are not carried on the local television or local cable system. As these hearings progress, I look forward to considering a must-carry proposal that does not shun the important principle of localism. The consumer issues being addressed today are extremely important, and I would like to welcome today's panel, and I look forward to their testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time uh, has expired. The chair now recognizes the uh, newest member of uh, the Energy and Commerce Committee and the uh, Telecommunications and Finance uh, Subcommittee, the uh, distinguished gentleman from the State of Maryland, uh, Mr. Tom McMillan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I certainly am uh, delighted to be on this committee. look forward to working with you and commend you for your leadership on these issues. As a new member, obviously, I don't have congealed views on these complicated issues. I just would like to make couple brief points. Can I note, though, that it is a little bit um, noteworthy and frightening to the rest of us that we have now cornered the market on Rhodes Scholars in Congress, and they're sitting right next to each other right now. <laughs> so uh, <coughs> any conversations that the two of you have down there will be noted by the rest of us. <laughs> Make them available for the record. <laughs> uh, my constituents, as many of yours, are concerned about uh, the rate increases that have occurred in the last several years, and obviously the GAO has documented that well. But I think most of my constituents as consumers also recognize that there has been a tremendous enhancement of the product going into the home, and that has been evolutionary. Uh, clearly, anybody who's watched TV in the last 10 years has seen a 
better product, a more varied product going into the home. And so I look forward to the GAO's updated report on this to really make a clear assessment <coughs> as to what we should do. And I think, it, I think their assessment will be fundamental to our deliberation. Last, just let me say that I agree with the gentleman from Virginia and agree with the gentleman from Pennsylvania that competition is fundamental here. It is in the best interest of our consumers that we encourage MDS and DBS and all the other variety of technologies that can bring product to the home. And so I say those things as a newcomer and just look forward to working with you as we uh, debate these important issues. Thank you. The gentleman's time uh, has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from the State of Colorado, Mr. Schaefer. I thank the chairman. There is a popular saying in Colorado, if you don't like the weather, wait 10 minutes and it is going to change. And although the time frame may be slightly longer, something similar can certainly be said about the telecommunications market. The difference is that the outlook for the American consumer only gets brighter. The forecast for cable television subscribers is no exception. Undeniably, Congress deserves a share of the credit. Close oversight of the Cable Act has undoubtedly increased the sensitivity of the industry to rate increases and poor customer service. For that, we should congratulate ourselves. But as much as we'd like to, we can't ignore the primary motivating factor for quality programming. Restrained rates and improved services, are, and only the marketplace can claim that responsibility. Left alone, it promises a great deal more. And more is what we as consumers should expect of the cable industry. There's no longer a fledging business struggling through franchise awards and construction costs. Rather, it is a maturing industry which must be willing to accept responsibility and concentrate more on retaining its current customers than attracting new ones. Failing to do so may have an impact in the legislative arena, and it certainly will in the competitive one. This realization is clearly reflected in the action of the cable industry. Subscriber rates, while never as excessive as many have claimed, have leveled off. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, while the consumer price index rose 4.6 percent last year, its cable component was up only 3.8 percent. These figures mark a trend that is expected to continue. And the recent GAO study that we all heard about and the increase of 26 percent since 1984 if we really put that in perspective, even though 26 percent sounds a lot, uh, when you have basic rates of $14 or $15, we're really only talking about a $3 uh, increase over that period of time. But stable rates are only part of the effective consumer satisfaction program. As a result, the cable industry has come forth with industry-wide consumer customer service standards. While some have criticized these guidelines for not being implemented sooner, None have excused them of not being genuine. And although labeled voluntary, it is important to note that the Cable Act permits their enforcement by local franchising authorities. This only adds to the already significant municipal control of supposedly unregulated industry. My district, like many others, has a population of approximately 550,000 people. And since 1984, I have received totally approximately 10 complaints uh, on various cable problems, and all of my district is wired. So therefore, uh, that is a very, very low complaint rate, and you would never expect 100 percent. Mr. Chairman, much of has changed since the subcommittee last met to discuss cable issues. Discounting the action of this industry, the mere announcement of Sky Cable has altered the debate beyond recognition. I therefore commend you for holding these hearings and not attempting to legislative shoot at what is clearly a moving target particularly when the marketplace provides the consumer with all the ammunition he or she needs. I look forward to the testimony of the witness today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cooper, for an opening statement. Thank the chair for calling this hearing, and I welcome very much your announcement that legislation is necessary in this area. I believe this means that we have the House and the Senate united in agreement that we do need to act in 1990 on these issues. I see this as far and away the most important consumer issue in telecommunications in 1990, perhaps for more years than that. You have groups not only like the Consumer Federation of America, but also the Wall Street Journal, thinking that we may be able to save the American consumer $6 billion a year. That's billion with a B. 
we may be able to cut cable rates in half if we find out a way to inject real competition into this virtual monopoly situation. Those are big numbers. Those are big claims. And no one can verify them until we see a real taste of good old-fashioned American competition in the marketplace. I would hope that our committee could recognize that we probably made a very serious mistake in 1984 with the Cable Act. We need to repeal or modify what we did then, and I would hope that just as members recognize that catastrophic health insurance wasn't the best act that we've ever passed in Congress, that we could also move to correct some of our mistakes from 1984. Whether it's the voucher bill and cable telco regulation or whether it's the Danforth bill, which is sometimes characterized as a re-regulation bill, but as the House uh, sponsor of that, I feel that it's more of a re-regulation as a last resort approach. We want competition first and foremost, and we feel that competition alone will be able to cut prices in half and save the American consumer hopefully almost $6 billion a year. So I would urge this committee to not only proceed, but to proceed very quickly on this issue. This is, as I said earlier, the number one consumer issue in telecommunications in 1980. I thank the chair. Gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Madigan. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to make my seven-page statement a part of the record. Uh, without objection, uh, the <laughs> gentleman's seven-page statement will be inserted in the record at the appropriate point. <laughs> <laughs> a, 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 a withdrawal of a facetious uh, a point of water raised against the gentleman's uh, uh, point. Does the gentleman wish to be recognized for the purpose of the gentleman's time has expired then? The chair recognizes the gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Richardson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, uh, once again, in terms of uh, commending you for holding this hearing, I want to join the chorus. You have certainly examined all the important issues facing the subcommittee in a procedural, academic, uh, and substantive manner. Secondly, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think the reason that we are here is twofold. One, uh, cable has gotten very big and very powerful. Secondly, cable has been pounded away as somebody that is insensitive to the consumer. I am here along with other members to deal with the issues and these charges that have been made as to whether cable is a monopoly. Looking at the foreign ownership issue, cable rates, customer service, sports <coughs> siphoning, must carry, vertical and horizontal integration, third party packaging, telephone company intro the video marketplace. I would also like to add another area, Mr. Chairman, and that's the concern I've had over Syndex, over consumers uh, getting blackouts because of a lack of an agreement between uh, cable and broadcasters. I think that's a very, very real issue that the subcommittee needs to add to its plate as we examine whether we need to fine-tune or re-regulate cable. I come from the fundamental premise that it's the Congress that should make telecommunications policy, <coughs> not Judge Green and not the FCC. I think we have a different situation now also. The FCC is more responsive to the Congress, more responsive to the public than the previous FCC, which I think operated on the open market philosophy, free market philosophy, and did a lot of damage to consumers as we look across the board in the entire telecommunications industry. Mr. Chairman, I am concerned that as we explore these hearings, uh, I am a, a bit concerned that some have made up their minds that we need to change the Cable Act. I don't think at this very juncture, unless these hearings determine otherwise, that credible evidence is there. I want to listen to these hearings, and I think every member of the subcommittee should as we look at the results of testimony, as we look at the GAO report this spring, and that we not act uh, simply because cable is undertaking and has been the recipient 
of a very vicious campaign. I, at this point, think it's important that we keep an open mind. Dealing with the issue of rates, I think if you look at the GAO report, the rates structure is plain. Cable has probably increased by about 15 percent. Look at other industries. I'm not saying this is justified. I'm not saying there's some people out there that unjustifiably are raising their rates. But I think it's be, we should be very careful about making a determination that, quote, rates are out of control. Yes, they've gone up. Yes, uh, perhaps we need to look at some ways that uh, ensure that those that not, cannot afford television, cannot afford cable, those minorities, those poor people that uh, if they want to watch a sporting event, maybe the only option in the future will be pay-per-view. I think we have to look at those issues, but I think any kind of condemnation or definite decision is, is not appropriate at this time. On the issue of service, I think we can all look to our own experience. Uh, I live in a rural area. Uh, many uh, rural entities, uh, largest town being uh, 50,000 people, a lot of satellite dishes. We had a problem with satellite dishes and programming and jamming and cable and the satellite dish uh, people basically worked out an agreement without the intervention of the Congress. And I had felt that cable had been wrong in their approach. But again, this seems to have been worked out by negotiations between the two parties. My only point, Mr. Chairman, is that I am open to supporting the kind of legislation that you outlined in your opening statement. But I think we have to be we have to be cautious. We have to weigh all the evidence. Uh, I think Cable is undertaking a very vicious PR campaign that uh, we should allow them to defend themselves. Yes, they're big and powerful. But I think, as my friend Mr. Schaefer mentioned, they have provided a lot of diversity, a lot of service. There's a lot of good educational cable TV out there. We have numerous more options to get more education and information about public affairs. We have, I think, a new informational age where cable is playing a very important part. So, Mr. Chairman, not to sound like somebody that doesn't want to do anything, I think we have to be careful. And I commend you for holding these hearings. I would like to ask unanimous consent, Mr. Chairman, to insert in the record a letter I've received from a constituent uh, from Gallup, New Mexico, uh, Bud uh, Bordeaux, which I think is uh, a very important statement. And I would just like to ask unanimous consent to insert it in the record. Without objection, uh, that statement will be included in the record at the appropriate point, and the gentleman's time has expired. The chair now recognizes uh, a gentleman from New York, Mr. Scheuer. Mr. Scheuer has been a member of the Telecommunications and Finance Subcommittee uh, uh, several times over the, over the last uh, decade or so, and he's rejoining the uh, subcommittee uh, as of today. And he is a, a, a very valuable and knowledgeable uh, member of, of the full committee on all of these subjects. And I think uh, it's, a, it's a very critical time when we have someone of his stature who can make the valuable contributions which he can make in this very important year. Well, Chair, I recognize the gentleman. For an I thank uh, the chairman for his more than kind and generous remarks. I'm very happy to return to this committee. Uh, the challenge is awesome. Uh, we're told that the average American spends seven to nine hours a day on television, uh, watching television. That means they're spending more than half their waking hours. Imagine <coughs> half of their working hours watching television. For most Americans, it's their primary source of, of news, of entertainment, and so forth. So our responsibility is great, and I congratulate you, Mr. Chairman, for uh, calling uh, these hearings. And, now I hope we'll hear the witnesses, so I'm glad to have the chance to get up to speed in this committee. Thank you, gentlemen. Gentlemen's time has expired. Um, chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Swift, if Thank he you. wishes. No opening statement. No opening statement. Um, the chair then would would at this point make an, uh, a unanimous consent to request that uh, with the indulgence of the, um, of the subcommittee members uh, that uh, Congressman uh, Christopher Shays from the state of Connecticut, who has had a long-standing interest in these cable 
uh, issues um, be allowed at this point um, to make an opening statement uh, as a guest of the subcommittee. And if there is no objection which is heard, uh, the Chair will recognize the gentleman from Connecticut for that purpose. Thank you, Chairman Markey and Congressman Rinaldi and uh, members of the subcommittee. Thank you for holding these important hearings and giving me this privilege to, uh, to make a statement. It has never ceased to amaze me that state government gave away cable franchises without requiring anything of significance in return, making instant millionaires out of cable operators. What amazed me even more was that Congress chose in 1984 to take what were clearly regional monopolies and deregulate them, allowing them to change service and increase prices at will, and they have. With deregulation, millionaires became multimillionaires, with consumer, cable consumers paying the bill. In fact, the Wall Street Journal recently noted cable rates may currently be twice with what they would be if cable operators faced true competition, meaning cable operators, meaning cable consumers may be overcharged six billion dollars each year. But even if it was one billion, it would be one billion too much. Let me give you two examples to illustrate who I feel was really served by deregulation. Franchises originally valued at approximately $600 per, dollars per subscriber before deregulation have increased in value to more than 2,500 a subscriber. This means the value of a franchise with one million subscribers has increased fourfold from 600 million to 2.5 billion in just eight years. The second example comes from my own area. Why, after deregulation, would a sports programmer pay a team over a half a billion dollars, far more than most sports franchises are even worth, for the right to broadcast its games for the next 12 years as Madison Square Garden Network paid the Yankees? The reason is simple. The programmer knew it would cost it could pass the cost on to the cable operator, who in turn could pass the cost with a generous profit to the consumer, who ultimately would be the one who would have to pay this. In contrast, before deregulation, the Mets sold broadcasting rights for only $30 million over eight years. It's not true that what's good for the cable operators is good for America. Cable operators remind me of the railroad barons of yesteryear who vigorously fought regulation, probably citing there were many other alternatives to travel. You could walk, ride a horse, take a barge. The only real beneficiaries of the 1984 Cable Act, as far as I can tell, have been cable operators who have made billions of dollars at the expense of the consumers. In my judgment, what we've done is grant cable operators a license to print money. Cable operators can't have it and shouldn't have it both ways. No competition and no regulation. Until competition exists, Congress, I feel, must allow the state and local franchising authorities the opportunity to re-regulate this industry. And I'm very grateful for giving this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. And we thank the gentleman for his participation and for his interest in the uh, issue. Um, are there any other members at this time that seek recognition for the purpose of making an opening statement? The chair uh, does not uh, see any other members seeking recognition at this time, so we will now turn to uh, our witness panel and we'll ask them if they could to come up and sit behind their appropriate uh, name cards uh, at the witness table. Uh, they consist of the Honorable Saul uh, N. Ramirez, Jr., the Mayor Pro Tem of the City of Laredo, Texas, Mr. James Mooney, President and Chief, uh, Chief Executive Officer of the National Cable Television Association, Mr. Paul Berra, who is uh, Cable Communications Manager of the City of St. Louis, Missouri, Mr. Gerald Hogan, President of Turner Entertainment Networks, Mr. James Robbins, President of Cox Cable Communications, and Mr. Gene Kimmelman, Legislative Director of the Consumer Federation of America. Um, what I would uh, ask of uh, each of you is that you um, restrict your opening statements to a five-minute um, period, and uh, I can assure you then during the uh, 
question and answer period that will that there will be plenty of opportunity for you to expand upon those major points which you make during your opening statement. Uh, but please try to adhere by that five minute limit. So let us begin then by recognizing uh, uh, Saul Ramirez, uh, the mayor of the city of Laredo, Texas. Welcome. Uh, members of the subcommittee, my name is Saul Ramirez Jr. Can and I'm an okay. elected member of the City Council of Laredo, Texas, and Mayor Pro Tem of the City. Thank you for the opportunity to appear today for the City of Laredo. The 1984 Cable Act was part compromise and part theory about how competition Mayor, to cable I, would uh, develop. Just ask yes. Move the microphone down a little bit. Lower. Certainly. Okay, thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Uh, the 1984 Cable Act was part compromise and part theory about how competition to cable would develop. It is time for a reality check on implementation of the theory. The Cable Act of 1984 must be reformed. I believe this for several reasons. First, the theory of the Act has proved to be flawed. Second, in Laredo, competition simply isn't. Third, cable is essential for adequate television. And fourth, cable consumers know they are being victimized. Congress's theory in 1984 was superficially attractive. Deregulate cable and competition will naturally control cable operator behavior. Had we testified then, we would have warned you that the theory did not parallel reality. Cable once built is a monopoly. Broadcasting is not competition to cable. Cable is a transmission medium all programmers must use to reach the homes of cable subscribers. In Laredo, effective competition is non-existent. Laredo is isolated geographically, disadvantaged economically, and overwhelmingly a Spanish language community. Laredo is the second poorest MSA in the entire nation, and in 1987, 37 percent of our families were below the poverty level. One in four of our citizens speaks no English, and about 94 percent of our people speak Spanish as the language of choice. Our system is one of the oldest cable systems operating. It was franchised in 1959. The system was regulated by local government up to 1984 when the Cable Act was passed. Since that time, the city encountered a series of problems created by national standards that do not address the unique needs of our community. People in Laredo must rely on cable for television in their language of choice and feel tied to cable as a fundamental necessity. Despite the extreme poverty, cable penetration is nearly 86 percent. Penetration has increased to that level despite four rate increases since 1984. I would like to add that I took part in rate regulating the industry in 1983 and am proud to say that after reviewing the cable company's request, our city council acted responsibly and allowed a rate increase which addressed a fair rate of return to the cable company. Basic rates today are 258% of their 1984 level. Basic now costs $17 per month. The rate in 1984 was $6.60. Yet during this time, cable penetration actually has increased. This shows market power, inelastic demand, and a lack of alternatives. Why does the cable operator have unrestricted pricing power in Laredo when under FCC theory Laredo prices should be res restrained by competitive forces if there are three television signals? First, we only have one over-the-air Spanish language uh, signal and it is low power. Second, we are highly dependent on the services available principally through cable. For us, cable is an essential window to the world. And as with other utility services, we cannot disconnect no matter what the price. Cable is essential for adequate, for adequate television. Cable in Laredo is not a luxury. Congress must recognize that cable is often essential and should be regulated like a public utility. Cable service is delivered for a, free un for a fee under public franchise over public property. To allow it to be priced without restraint denies the reality of our people's lives. Consumers know they are being victimized. Today, cable operators have little incentive to offer high quality service that is fairly priced. A recent example is a realignment and higher price for Spanish language signals. On September 1, 1989, the operator moved two key Spanish signals. The practical consequence is that Spanish-speaking households without cable-ready sets must pay an extra $5.50 per month to receive three Spanish channels. We believe this violates our franchise, and the company cites the Cable Act as, as its authority. It would be costly to litigate, so the realignment and higher costs continue. Technical standards, which originally were part of our franchise, have now been emasculated by the Cable Act of 1984. Local authorities must be empowered to regulate the dropping and repositioning of local broadcast channels and other cable channels. 
Like you, I am an elected official. Like you, I serve our people with pride and want to protect them from unfair treatment. We must act together to restore regulatory sanity and competitive balance to the cable marketplace. And in summation, I believe in competition and fairness. For this to happen, Congress must empower us to restrain unfair pricing by cable monopolies. When Ted Rogers sold our system, Laredo exported $55 million from the pockets of citizens into a Canadian bank. This was five times more than he paid for the system just eight years earlier. What do we have to show for it now? The same limited capacity uh, cable system, but with reduced service, fewer jobs, more expensive Spanish programming, and, a dramatic, and dramatically increased rates. It is as if an unbridled horse is trampling consumers and the community. Let us pull back the reins and restore the balance. To do this, we ask your help in reforming the Cable Act. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, <coughs> the time has expired, and the uh, chair will now recognize uh, James uh, Mooney, who is president and uh, chief executive officer of the National Cable Television Association, a uh, frequent, frequent and welcome guest to the uh, subcommittee. Welcome, Mr. Mooney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Could you move the microphone yeah. over, please? Yeah, oh, sorry. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I've submitted an extensive prepared statement, which I hope will make part of your record. Without objection, the, your statement, uh, your written statement and all the written, written statements and any other supportive data which uh, the panelists wish to have included in the record will be included without objection. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I correctly understand the message which has been sent to us by this committee, during the past year or two, it has been that while members Can of the committee, the microphone up, it has been that while members of the committee understand and appreciate the strides which the cable industry has taken in expanding and improving the world of television programming, the committee also has had a great deal of concern over cable rates and customer service. As you put it last August, Mr. Chairman, when you commented on the then just release GAO study of cable rates. Uh, the majority of cable operators seem to have been responsible and fair in establishing basic cable rates in the years since deregulation, but there was evidence, too, that some cable operators appeared to have taken undue advantage and that it was unclear whether the rate increases were one-time adjustments or reflected a continuing trend in cable rates. Uh, I suggested to you then that a spurt in cable rates immediately following deregulation was reasonably to be expected given the fact that we had been held 72 points behind the Consumer Price Index during the 14 years we were subject to City Council regulation. I also said, however, that we were extremely sensitive to the Committee's concerns on rates and service, which we regard as entirely legitimate, that during the first six months of 1989, cable price increases had leveled off, and that for the first six months of the year, we were within the overall CPI. Today I can tell you that we now have the CPI figures for all 12 months of 1989 and has been remarked by several members this morning the trend of cable prices staying within the overall CPI has continued. Uh, during 1989, co overall consumer prices rose by 4.6 percent, but cable subscriber bills rose by only 3.8 percent. Uh, the record is even stronger today than it was last August then that after an initial post-deregulatory spurt, cable subscriber bills are now staying within the overall inflation rate in the consumer economy. On the other consumer-oriented issue which, with which the committee has been concerned, uh, customer service, we have also been taking steps to achieve a uniformly higher level of responsiveness to our customers' needs. Uh, two weeks ago, after a fairly arduous uh, process of internal deliberation, we announced industry-wide customer service standards which are precisely and specifically designed to address the concerns we have heard not only from this committee but from our customers as well. Uh, my colleague Mr. Robbins will go into greater detail about these standards, but I'd like to make just one point. Uh, these standards represent a good faith effort on the part of our industry to be responsive to the concerns we've heard expressed here and in other places. Uh, our companies intend to fully comply with these standards by the target date of July 1991. Uh, moreover, while our lawyers tell us there is no way that our trade association can enforce these standards consistent with the antitrust laws, we believe the standards can and will be enforced by franchising authorities. 
Uh, the State of New York has already enacted similar customer service standards applicable to all cable systems within its jurisdiction, and the City of Denver, by municipal ordinance, has already enacted and is considering additional customer service standards very close to or identical with the standards we've recommended. Uh, what I want to convey, then, is that our industry has been responsive on the twin issues of rates and customer service. And while we certainly do not claim to have achieved perfection, we're very clearly moving in the right direction. Uh, now, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to use my remaining minute in commenting on a few things that Mayor Ramirez said, because we're not unsympathetic to some of the problems he's had. And I think I perhaps can shed a little light, additional light, on, on that situation. First, I think it should be clear that according at least to the information I have, part of the problem in Laredo resulted from the elimination of the lowest price tier of service, the so-called classic cable service involving the retransmission of broadcast signals. And, and I think that is the source of the very large percentage number you heard in terms of, of, of the basic rate increase. That It really doesn't reflect the, base, the, the, the rate increase on an apples and apples basis. It results from the fact that people who had been on the lowest cost tier in order to stay on the cable had to buy a bigger package. That has been the source, uh, in, in my experience, of a lot of the horror stories we hear around here. And you may want to keep that in mind as, as you consider what might be an appropriate step to take or not to take. Second, I, I think in fairness uh, to my side, it should be understood, too, uh, that cities themselves occasionally contribute to these problems. Uh, I note that, again, according to the information I have, when Rogers sold that system to Houston Industries a couple of years ago, as a condition of approving the license transfer, the city required a cash payment of $2.3 million, which they put to use uh, in building a new police station. And we are not against new police stations. But I think you have to consider uh, whether an appropriate use of, of, of regulatory authority is, is what amounts to the extraction of money from cable subscribers. The 2.3 million has got to come from someplace. And, and you might keep that in mind, too, as you consider uh, what to do or not to do here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair now recognizes Mr. Paul Berra, uh, Cable Communications Manager for the City of St. Louis, Missouri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and honorable members of the subcommittee. Uh, my name is Paul G. Berra. I'm the elected president of the National Association of Telecommunication Officers and Advisors and the Cable Communications Manager for the City of St. Louis. Today I am pleased to have the opportunity to appear on behalf of the TOA, which represents the professional employees of local governments responsible for regulating cable television operators and cable franchises. On behalf of our association, which serves as the advisor to the National League of Cities on telecommunication issues, we fully support a comprehensive revision of the Federal Cable Act. The problem in cable television today is quite simple. Cable television wire is a natural monopoly. The person who owns that wire is a monopolist. And under the current structure of the Cable Act, the cable monopolist is essentially unregulated. Cable is the electronic gateway to the television sets of this nation, and the cable operator solely holds the key to that gate. The best solution to monopoly abuses is to introduce competition. Where competition is not possible because of the economics of the marketplace, government has to protect consumers through effective regulation. NATOA has three top priorities which are central to the focus of today's hearings. Rate re-regulation tied to a revised definition of effective competition, a process for establishing standards and policies for rate regulation that has franchise authorities as key participants, and power for state and local governments to establish lifeline services for low-income consumers. The committee is well aware of the escalating prices for cable service around the nation. In the city of St. Louis, for example, cable rates have increased from $9.45 in 1986 to our present rate of $15.23, an increase of 61 percent. During the same time, the cost of living index in the city of St. Louis has increased only 10.5 percent. Yet, our cable operator, TCI, has informed our city that effective April 1st of this year, basic cable rates will be increased to $16.95 a 79 percent increase since rate deregulation went into effect. What we are experiencing is rate inflation, 
unrelated to cost as the industry seeks the highest prices consumers are willing to pay for cable. Without competition and without regulation, the cable industry is seeking to find the highest price that consumers are willing to pay. There is much talk that any form of rate regulation should exclude local franchising authorities. Without a specific proposal on the table, it is difficult to comment in detail. However, I ask that the committee remain sensitive to the fact that cable television is the only video technology capable of serving the narrow specific needs of each community, individual community. Narrow casting can and does serve small, unique communities of interest. For this reason, cable television design is uniquely a local community decision. NATOA is willing to work with you to create a regulatory environment that is sensitive to community needs and requirements, efficient and easy to administer from the cable operator standpoint, and consistent with national communications policy. But we insist that the system be effective and provide real protection for consumers against monopoly pricing power. We have heard about the new customer service standards proposed by the National Cable Television Association. I have three reactions. First, these are not new standards. Second, I was dismayed to learn the industry chose to develop and announce these standards without consulting with local regulators who are the primary recipients of consumer complaints. Finally, I am leery that the industry means to improve its behavior. I do not believe calls from NCTA for cable operators to voluntarily spend more money will work. They have no economic incentive to change their behavior. The substance of the NCTA proposed standards is minimal. The City of St. Louis ordinance equals or exceeds the standards proposed. At the same time, I have never heard from my local cable operator that our standards in St. Louis are unrealistic, unfair, or unduly burdensome. Congress should not be misled. Simple, voluntary consumer standards are not a substitute for effective government oversight. There are many myths and misconceptions about the goals and interests of local governments in the franchising process. How are we supposed to grant franchises to companies that don't even apply? How are we supposed to force companies to compete with each other when they are determined to avoid competition at all costs? Cities would welcome genuine and viable competition. The second franchisee is willing to accept the equivalent burden of public service obligations as the initial operator, then there is seldom a reason not to issue a second franchise, assuming that adequate room is within the rights of ways. However, local franchising authorities oppose legislation that requires any level of government to favor one cable entrant over another. If the proponents of multiple franchises means the second entrant does not have to assume similar public interest obligations, local authorities will strongly oppose it. The 1984 experiment has devastated consumers' pocketbooks. The local franchising authorities were not then and are not now the villains. The best way to restore fair treatment to consumers is to ask cable operators to accept reasonable public interest obligations. We ask that they accept regulation of their rates and service offerings to prevent abuses of monopoly power. On behalf of NATOA and in the City of St. Louis, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman. Give me the time to address this issue. Thank you, Mr. Ver very, very much. Our next witness, Mr. James O. Robbins, is the uh, president of the Cox uh, Cable Communications uh, and a uh, longtime friend of the subcommittee. Welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I appreciate particularly the opportunity to be here to talk about the treatment of rates at Cox Cable and customer service both at Cox Cable and in the industry. Cox Cable is part of a company that started in 1898 in the newspaper business, then went into radio and then television and finally in cable. We've been in the cable business for 28 years. We take our commitment to the communities that we serve and the customers that we serve very seriously. And we take seriously also the way we handle our rates. I want to share with you some numbers here. For the years following the passage of the Cable Act, the revenue out of each cable household in Cox Cable averaged an increase of 3.75 percent per year. The same period, the Consumer Price Index was up 3.6 percent a year. I think that's a record of enormously responsible behavior on the part of this cable company. Both the chairman and the 
Um, and Mr. Ronaldo mentioned stability in their opening comments. It is the stability that the Cable Act provided for us that we have been able to rebuild and upgrade 90 percent of our distribution system in the years between 1984 and 1994. We have also added a significant amount of programming to our lineup in response to our customers' demand for variety and choice. Programming as a percentage of our total cost of doing business in 1984 was 21 percent. Today it is 33 percent. Increases in our programming budget line over the last three years have been 20 percent, 9 percent and 19 percent respectively. What I particularly wanted to share with you, however, this morning is our determination to provide our customers with terrific service. Cox has been a leader in the industry on this issue. Two years ago, we began developing standards for service and came up with 21 hard, measurable statistics in seven service categories. January 1 of 1989, these standards went into effect in all of our systems. And to put teeth into them, we have tied our manager's compensation into the improvement on a year-to-year -year basis in customer service. Mr. Mooney mentioned a second ago that the entire cable industry adopted customer service standards uh, two weeks ago. We invite franchising authorities to adopt and enforce these standards. Let me say a few words about them. First, in the area of office and telephone availability, the industry will ensure that knowledgeable, qualified company representatives are available to respond to telephone inquiries Monday through Friday during normal business hours. In addition, based on community needs, cable systems will staff phones for supplemental hours, weekdays or weekends. Telephone answer time by a customer service representative including wait time and the time required to transfer a call will not exceed 30 seconds. In area number, second area, installations, outages and service calls, installations will be done within seven business days after an order is placed. Appointments for installation will be offered in three time slots, morning, afternoon or all day during normal business hours. Every effort will be made to contact a customer if an installer or a technician is behind schedule and the appointment rescheduled if necessary. Service interruptions will be dealt with promptly and in no event later than 24 hours after the interruption. Third and final area covers communications, bills and refunds. Each system will provide complete written information on products, prices, service policies and directions for use. Bills will be clear and understandable. Refunds will be issued promptly. Our industry has a real serious commitment to implementing these standards. We are ready to invest the dollars that are necessary. I can say from our experience with our work in the last two years at Cox that our customers are now getting faster, higher quality service with easier access to us by phone and in the office and our customers have had significantly fewer service problems. I think we must be doing something right. Thirty-six of our franchises have come up for renewal since the Cable Act went into effect and all thirty-six have been renewed. On top of that, ten other communities have awarded us brand new franchises. I want to leave you this morning with one fact no country in the world has the viewing choices and options that the American people have today. And at a price in our system that comes in at less than 14 cents per viewing hour for the average cable television household. That world leadership position came about because you created an environment with the 1984 Act that allowed cable to be stable, creative and productive. I ask you to weigh the positive effect, the positive effective job that the great bulk of the cable television industry is doing before you consider altering the environment that has created this unique American success story. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your Thank you, Mr. Robbins, very much. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Gerald Hogan, who is the president of Turner Entertainment 
Networks here from Atlanta, Georgia. Welcome, Mr. Hogan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, distinguished members of this subcommittee. My name is Jerry Hogan. I'm president of Turner Entertainment Networks, a subsidiary, subsidiary of Turner Broadcasting System in Atlanta. I'm here today to discuss how the Cable Act has spawned the emergence of basic cable networks. These networks, like our own CNN, Headline News, and now TNT, have in turn begun to create a world of distinctive, high-quality television that offers consumers the ability to watch what they want, precisely the kind of world Congress envisioned in 1984. In the pre-Cable Act days of City Council regulation, investment in cable programming was minimal, and operators <clears throat> struggled to gain a return on their investment. The Cable Act changed all that. In return for deregulation of basic rates, <clears throat> operators were expected to invest in plant and programming while cable networks were expected to provide consumers with television that the broadcasters had either abandoned or never attempted. This is exactly what we at Turner Broadcasting tried to do. We saw an opportunity to expand the variety of programming available as part of basic cable service. It allowed us to strengthen CNN. It allowed us to strengthen headline news, and it allowed us to strengthen the superstation TBS. And most important, the Cable Act has enabled us to launch TNT, Turner Network Television. TNT's goal is to raise the overall quality level of television programming by taking the high road and presenting original programs which both entertain and inform viewers using cultural, historical, and social themes as our subject matter. If system operators had not had the freedom to spend money on new and risky programming for basic cable service, without gaining permission from thousands of different local franchising authorities, Turner Broadcasting would never have been able to, to have seen the birth of TNT. The startup cost of a new cable network is enormous. It is even more so with the ambitious plans that we have for TNT. Expenses for the first 39 months will exceed $459 million, while projected advertising revenues for the same period will be about $170 million. Without substantial fees from cable operators to help cover the $289 million deficit, TNT would never have taken off. As it turns out, TNT had the largest launch in cable history and in only 18 months has grown to over 40 million subscribers, about 70 percent of all the cable homes in the United States. TNT is now the third highest rated basic cable network. This proves that there is a large audience for quality programming, just as we thought. TNT's launch also stimulated competition between the established basic cable networks to produce original films for cable. TNT's commitment to create original films reinforced the interest of USA Network, the Family Channel, Lifetime, the Nashville Network and others to produce more of their own quality programming. I estimate that in 1990, over 50 original films will be produced for basic cable, as compared with only one in 1988. TNT has produced and aired 19 original projects to date. One of them is a film by Ted Geisel. You may know him better as Dr. Seuss. I'll tell you just a brief story about that film. Dr. Seuss is the largest selling author of children's books in the world and was also a successful producer of quality children's programming for television. However, he had not produced a show for television in almost eight years. Why? Because, as he told us, he was not able to get the commitment he wanted nor the creative control he needed from the established broadcast networks. So the creator of The Grinch That Stole Christmas Horton Hears the Who, The Lorax, and many others stopped making films for television. TNT was able to convince Dr. Seuss that we had the commitment he needed and that we would give him the creative freedom that he required to again produce for television. The result? The Butter Battle Book one of, what is now one, considered one of the finest children's television programs in a long, long time. This production is so good and so entertaining 
that not only did it generate record audiences for children's programming and basic cable and receive universal critical praise, but also Soviet television played it on its largest network for all Soviet children to enjoy. A film like The Butter Battle Book would never have been made if it weren't for the unique cooperation and support which TNT received from the cable industry. With the distribution advantage that the broadcast networks enjoy over basic cable and recognizing competitive conditions in a 40 or 50 channel cable system, it is critical to TNT that we continue to expand our dual revenue stream of subscriber fees and advertising revenue. Our plans for the future are very ambitious. One year from now, we plan to significantly increase our original special events. Subscriber fees are critical if TNT is to continue to produce quality projects that will entertain, inform, and inspire American television viewers. Our future is in your hands. If you regulate cable services, you will choke off investment in programming. In particular, if the government tries to control the price of, of cable programming distributed by satellite, you throttle the efforts of companies like Turner Broadcasting System to provide new and innovative television to the American public. Cable programmers have held up their end of the bargain under the Cable Act. Please do not change the rules midstream. Just as the industry is about to come of age, tomorrow's television depends on what you do today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hogan, very much. Uh, and our final uh, witness, uh, uh, a frequent and well-respected uh, visitor to uh, these uh, confines, uh, Mr. Gene Kimmelman, is uh,